Hi, and welcome to episode 53, or the first episode of season five of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. It's also episode three on YouTube, uh, and uh, Jay and Caitlin did not know that until I just said it right now, so that's really good. Um, you know, I like to surprise my guests with anything, everything. But again, um, as we've had every single season, and as, uh, you know, we, he said it the last time, he had peaked in season one a little too early. Uh, apparently there's a lot of people who heard that because it went up really quickly in the season four. So we'll say again that you peaked too early and even episode five will be around, but, um, uh, Jay ball is here and, uh, Caitlin day D who is been on for what our third time now. Mm-hmm. And, um, has been a great guest. Really enjoyed her, ta- her, her insight and hopefully she can hold up me and Jay this time. So, uh, cause you know, that's just how things are. Give it my best shot. All right. Um, we'll pretend no one knows who you are, but uh, just a quick intro. Uh, Jay, if you wanted to start, just give me a quick intro of you. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Jay Ball. I'm a uh, sworn police officer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for a little over 18 years. Um, I'm a veteran of the United States Army uh, back in the uh, mid late nineties, uh, starting to the early two thousands and, uh, currently almost done pursuing my, uh, master's in forensic psychology. Well, welcome. And you work with, also with, uh, the veterans court. Yeah. A veterans treatment court in Middlesex County. Yes. Well, as I already know you, I'm not welcoming you, but I should welcome you to the podcast. Um, uh, Caitlin, uh, <laughs> You want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Caitlin Dehe. I am a licensed mental health clinician. I uh, currently am working at Westboro Behavioral uh, Health Hospital. I'm doing a uh, partial hospitalization and an intensive outpatient program for first responders. Um, Prior to that, I worked for eight years with advocates in the co-response jail diversion program, um, which is sort of what led me to um, want to fill the gap uh, for first responder treatment. Um, So that's where, where, where I came from, what brought me here. So thanks for having me. Well, it was great. Also, yesterday we had a get together and I finally met you face to face, which was really nice to meet you. Uh, This two years have been meeting people virtually way too long. So it was great to meet Mm -hmm. you yesterday face to face. Finally. Yeah, agreed. It It was a nice event. Thanks for hosting. Ah. Yeah, well, it's everyone else's turn at this point, I think. Uh, But anyway, um, one of the things that, you know, we've you've talked about, you know, working at Westboro Behavioral and talking about the IOP and the partial a lot, Caitlin. I've, you know, I I kind of figured out a couple of things, but it might be important for maybe our audience to kind of know the difference because I've ran a partial. I used to be a director for a partial and IOP. Uh, how do you think it looks different for first and last responders versus just a regular IOP and a partial? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, for those unfamiliar with the terms partial and IOP, um, it's sort of a um, in-between level of care, right? So we have like outpatient level of care where people go see a therapist once a week, twice a week, once a month, whatever the frequency is. Um and then there's, of course, inpatient level of care uh, when, you know, there's a, a safety issue. Um, people go and stay somewhere for treatment um, for, you know, a week or two at the most, usually. Um, and then there's this in-between level of care um, that we call uh, partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient or PHP and IOP. Um, and there. Um, the partial hospitalization is a five day a week treatment program. Um, it's for, you know, usually, uh, seven to eight hours, uh, sort of like going to a job. Um, and it consists of group therapy, some individual therapy, um, and, uh, some medication management. And then the intensive outpatient, um, is sort of a step down from that. So if you can think of the partial as, like a step down from inpatient level of care, like you're still going every day, but or five days a week, but you get to go home and be home on weekends. And then the intensive outpatient program is like even a step further down from that, but like still sort of more intensive than regular outpatient. So 
that's three days a week, um, usually about five hours. Um, and again, group therapy, individual stuff. Um, not typically medication management, but if you had medication management in the partial hospitalization and step down to the IOP, um, the tip will we'll typically follow that until we're able to provide an uh, outpatient prescriber to take over that medication management. Um, and I think the important thing about having a separate track for first responders um, is that, you know, I hear a lot of first responders say, you know, like most of my stress, like isn't job related, right? Like it's, you know, uh, marriage issues or it's uh, stress with kids or it's, you know, stuff sort of at home, or maybe it's trauma from military service, whatever that might be. But when we're really sitting down and talking about it, a lot of the things that are difficult for them in terms of being in a relationship, um, you know, connecting with their kids, things like that, it really all does tie back to the job because the job is so different than the job that the average person has, right? And so you're talking about being in a high stress environment where whether you're a firefighter, EMS, police, a doctor, a nurse, you're doing these these jobs where your entire shift, it's like, go, go, go. It's high adrenaline. There's trauma that you're seeing on a daily basis. And you go home and like having to like interact with your kids and your like significant other is a lot harder than it is for people who just have a office job or, you know, uh, are working from home doing whatever. Um, it's a different level of needing to sort of disconnect um, after, you know, eight hours or in some first responder cases, you know, double shifts, 24 hours of work and they come home and, you know, their significant other wants help with, you know, cooking dinner or help with the kids homework and the parent, the kids want whatever they need from the parents. And when you've been giving yourself to the people you serve as a first responder for that entire shift, coming home and needing to do that same thing is like, you never get a chance to turn it off. And so even though first responders are like, well, you know, most of my stress isn't about the job. Yeah, that's true. in the fact that the stress comes from outside of the job, but the reason it's more stressful for, for those people than for some other people is because the job you have is more stressful. And so I think having that to relate to one another in a group setting with other first responders is something that you won't get in a general track program because it, it's hard for people to relate to that. Um, I myself thought I understood what first responder work was like uh, and then I worked as a co-responder clinician and I had no freaking idea before I had that job, what it looked like to be a police officer, a firefighter, EMS, um, a nurse, doctors, I had no clue. And then to see it up close and personal, like it's hard to describe what the intensity of that looks like to somebody that doesn't do it or hasn't done it. And so having other people that get that to connect to, to talk about life stress is just gives um, an understanding that uh, can be hard to get from the average track of, you know, people who have, you know, I don't want to say regular jobs, but I guess, you know, diff jobs that aren't first responder jobs. I think it's a great explanation. I appreciate that. And thank you for also clarifying the partial versus uh, intensive outpatient. Um, I'll turn to you, Jay, for a second and ask you, like, you know, I, one of the things that I kind of like got from the, the uniqueness of the work sometimes can be hard to relate to other people. Would there be other reasons you think that um, might keep also from opening up in another track if there wasn't a first responder type of track? Um, as, as in, say, police officers, for example, uh, not wanting to go for therapy, is that? Uh, well, well, more like at not going to an IOP, let's say at uh, Jane Doe University. I'm just making the name up, but you know, yeah, have, so having the the general population, maybe the civilian population, for lack of a better word. 
Yeah. Um, there's sometimes a stigma associated with it. Um, you know, Caitlin, and I talked the other day and uh, it was a discussion and we've had this discussion before. It just actually came up uh, a few days ago, Massachusetts. We're different than most States. In my opinion, um, I see buddies of mine that teach, say, for example, mental health first aid, they'll teach in New York, they'll teach the firefighters and their class is very, I don't want to say structured because when you do teach mental health first aid, you know, it is a structured class, but they do things in a certain way where in Massachusetts teaching police officers, um, I don't want to say it's a skill, but it's, uh, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting, uh, I don't know, phenomenon is probably a bad word, but I don't know what it is uh, about us. Other states, uh, for example, you mentioned IOPs and, and other, uh, you know, treatment, you know, treatment plans. It, it's, I think one-on-one -on -one works for a lot of people. A lot of officers I know, a lot of military members I know, they want to go one-on-one. -on -one. They don't want to be in a group. And um, I know when I hear that, oh, I had two, I had three, I had four people actually come in and for a group of police officers, it actually surprises me in the state. If you told me in Maryland you had a group of 20 police officers, I'd be like, all right, yeah, cool. If you told me you had 20 police officers in a room in a group in Massachusetts and I can't, maybe I should, you know, go for my doctorate and, uh, and study why we're different in this state, but, uh, it is. And, you know, you could probably put it around the stigma. Um, but I really don't have an explanation for it. Uh, it it's just, um, it's just different. It's different in the state for some reason. I don't know why it's not. I don't think it's that officers think they're better than anyone or uh, they're scared or they're I just don't have a word to put with it I mean, maybe Caitlin uh, can her her side from the outside looking in but I I just think I and we've gotten this discussion Caitlin and I go oh yeah it's not gonna work you gotta do one-on-one -on -one. and she goes I know Jay I understand this but I gotta run groups I said all right good luck with that it's different you know like I said Caitlin maybe you got a different way yeah, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts. One, I think, uh, like, if we're being honest, like, nobody wants to do group therapy. Like, if you asked, if, if I was struggling and you wanted to put me in group therapy, I'd kind of probably be like, nah, I'm good. Um, it just, the idea of it is so stigmatized in general, like, forgetting about the first responder piece, like, group therapy in general is just not something people are psyched about. Um, but what I, and I, and we do currently have a group and I do have first responders in, in it and it's small, but it's, uh, it's a group and we're, we're making it happen. But um, what I keep telling them is, you know, the um, value of having other people to relate to that kind of understand what you're going through that you can't get from individual therapy, right? Like even even as a first responder who is trained to do therapy, it's still challenging to relate to exactly what somebody is going through when you're in the therapist role. And so having people around you that really get what you're, you know, really get the, the stuff that you have on your plate is invaluable because it really gives you that sense of, or, helps alleviate I guess the sense of isolation right like when you're going through severe depression or anxiety or you're struggling with substance use that can be a really isolating thing and having others around you that get it and have you know you hear people in group be like oh my god I can't believe you said that like I felt that same way like a few weeks ago or whatever and you and you learn from each other's experiences and how people have dealt with things that you might be dealing with currently. So I think there's that piece in general. Um, and then the other th thing sort of backtracking to the value of having a first responder track versus a general population track is, you know, first responders, whether they're police, fire, EMS, physicians, they're seeing people in their community for whatever, right? They're, whether it's you're responding to a medical or to a mental health crisis or their patients of yours as a physician, you don't wanna be in group therapy with 
with people who you've arrested or sexually well transported on a medical emergency, um, seen as a patient in your, you know, medical practice. You don't want to be in group therapy with those same people, right? That's a conflict. Uh, it's uncomfortable. It would be uncomfortable. Um, and so, having the first responder track specific sort of helps alleviate that chance, right? Minimize that chance. It's people that, you know, you're not going to be in in therapy with somebody that you transported to the ER a few weeks ago. Um, and so I think that piece helps. And we really tried to be intentional about that. We've staggered the start times and the break times because the groups are running at the same time as our general track, but we've staggered those things specifically so that like first responders aren't running into people in the hallway that, you know, they might have interacted in those ways with. So we're trying to be really intentional and thoughtful about how we, how we do it. Um, and there is, there is value in it, especially for the stabilization piece, right? Like long-term, it, it's not a long-term treatment. It's a short-term couple weeks treatment, but it's really for stabilizing whatever the crisis is. And then we can refer to people like you, Steve, um, and some of your colleagues that I met last night for sort of that more long-term outpatient treatment. And I think that follow-up is so important after an IOP partial, any type of stuff. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to add something and Jay, you're, you, I'm going to turn to both of you for this too. Um, and I've worked, you know, uh, with police officers in different state, not as much as you, Jay, nor do I want to pretend I have the same experience as you, but I got to tell you that what I've found that is particularly different in Massachusetts than let's say Vermont, Florida, even New York, and is the sarcasm game is pretty strong in Massachusetts. And when there is a group setting, sometimes that sarcasm really kicks in, especially if it's a bunch of other first responders. So that's my personal observation, because I've ran a group, too, for a while with first responders. And it's not that I, they, the fact that I ran a group for a year with a first responder is only once a week. But I thought that the sarcasm sometimes kind of like gets a little staggering for some people. And that's just my two cents. I don't know if that resonates to you, Jay, just giving you my opinion. Yeah, Caitlin, what do you say? What's, <laughs> what, what do you say in class? Um, about sarcasm? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, first responders are fluent in sarcasm, is what I say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's different. I'm not sure. Like, um, it, it's funny you bring up the sarcasm. And, and you have, you do have the experience in, in Vermont and other states. Um, one of my you know, best friends is a police officer in Washington State. And um, to hear sometimes the, the things um, that they do that are different than Massachusetts, I'm like, wow, you get everyone to do that, really? <laughs> and then I bring up New York, upstate New York. Like, you get you get guys to do that, really? And then we'll bring up like SISM and and um, you know after action reviews, um, uh, you know after a major incident in Massachusetts, and it's not that we we don't do them, but I, I joke about it in in some classes, and I say. Yep. All right. We got 20 guys in there. They're there probably because you get paid overtime and everyone's staring at each other, complaining and bitching and moaning that they're there. And everyone's got probably something to say. I'll say if we have 20 in there, 17 have something to say. I don't say a word to each other. And then on the way out the door, you've got, hey, you got a second? Hey, you got a second? Hey, you got a second? It's the same thing when Caitlin and I uh, will teach a class. No one says a word. And that's great. No one's going to volunteer anything. But whether it's at a break, whether it's um, on the way out the door, whether it's it, it's awesome to have them come up, but no one wants to do it in that group setting. Um, but I do think in Massachusetts where we are pretty sarcastic um, and maybe some of my buddies in Rhode Island would want to compare states. But other than that, I do think we're sarcastic around here. And obviously, and I always refer to Caitlin's, but it is a coping mechanism. Um, right. And some of the things what Caitlin was talking originally, I just thought of last night alone in uh, where I work, nothing crazy happened. Um, and just for example, typical, we call a family problem when, uh, um, you know, people hear domestic violence, we, we have something, if there isn't domestic violence, there's no physical, you know, contact or anything. That's an, an argument that married couples or any couples or any person in a relationship go through, but you stand there and I, I, I sit back now as a supervisor, I sit back and watch the officers handle it. And I got a husband and a wife, they can't get along. So they call the police and the husband is there and he's saying he's angry at his wife, 
but he's like, I don't want her to leave the house. I will go to a hotel. She's there and she's having a problem. And you sit there and this is nothing. This is what we do every day. And like I said, as, as counselors and therapists yourselves, you, you deal with this. So we sit there and I was sitting back and I'm like, what, what person, and what job deals with this? You know, this, it's awful. And we all have little conversations and disagreements in our own lives with maybe significant others or loved ones or whatnot. But I sit there and I go, no one got hit. No one uh, was, was, you know, verbally abused to the point of demeaning, whatever. It's an argument, but it just couldn't be settled. And one person wanted to leave the house. That wears on that officer. That officer's in there, could have relationship issues at home. And that just that small amount, I look at that. Um, another thing, as small as it sounds, and I, I'm not trying to make excuses or whine, but um, person, for example, we're having tough times financially, not you know ourselves, but the, you know the United States and the world as a whole. And um, person driving down the street, suspended license, um, revoke for insurance, uh, pet peeve of mine, uh, because if someone has revoke registration without insurance, they get an accident person they hit or just whatever could happen they're not getting they have to pay for their own damage to that car the the victim or whatnot but then you hear the story and i lost my job then i decided to take what money i had and go to the casino and i was losing money and then i started drinking and you hear this on and on and you've got to enforce the law but as a human being you feel bad for this person um that they're using all the now by law, you can't let them drive their car without insurance around, but now they've got their car towed and now they have no option to get to work. They have no option to get where they're going. So it's like most officers right now are thinking and, and, and like, geez, Jay, you serious? You think that much? Yeah, I do. And maybe not when I started, but now I'm like, yeah, because by enforcing that law and, and we can't let people drive around with insurance, but now their only asset to get to a job, to get to wherever they need to be has been taken away from them. And their life's getting worse. You know, do I lose sleep over it? No. But do I think of it? Yeah. Because, and those are the small things. We can always talk about children dying. We always talk about murders. We can talk about violence. We can talk about car accidents. Those are the easy, I don't want to say easy things, but those are the things that people think of every day. Oh my God, tell me the story. Tell me the story. But it's the simple things. It's the arguments. It's the, it's the uh, people that may not be able to afford to register their car. Um, it may be the refrigerator that doesn't have any food in it at a, at a house with a child in it, those small things. Um, and just kind of going towards that as stresses for first responders. Uh, something I always bring up in class, I ask everyone as, in a specific class, tell me where you're from, how long you've been on, um, are you a veteran? And what did you do before you're a police officer? And I get people that say, oh, I was this, I was a student, I was that. And I had one officer from a, a Metro Boston city tell me that she was um, an office manager, a billing manager. And I use her as a description all the time. Um, and I usually pick on Fidelity Investments. So I apologize in advance if I make fun of that. I just, it just, I'm going to try out. to get sponsorship after this. I got right. <laughs> but I said, what's the, and I've had a lot of great answers. I've had butchers in class. I've had people work in grocery stores, uh, clothing stores. She was, like I said, a billing manager. I said, what was the toughest decision you ever made before you were a police officer? And she looks and she's like, I, I wear high heels. I wore high heels to work. What color high heels? And think of that. Her job is important. It, it was a billing, um, billing for, for a medical office. That's important, <laughs> you know? Um, but the toughest decision she had was what heals. And she made it tongue in cheek. She laughed, but it was now think of that in, as a police or first responder, even in your own lives as therapists, you know, clinicians, think of that. Think of what the toughest decision you have to make every day is. It's a heck of a lot tougher than what dress do I wear? What suit do I wear? What tie do I wear? You know, um, car accidents, person flees the scene. Yeah, you want to know why someone fled the scene, but also if there's blood at the scene, Jesus, the person get injured. Am I making the right decision? Are people second guessing me? Are people um, uh, going to, why did I do that? Why did the officer do that? Well, split second decisions. It's easy to sit there the day after and have an hour, two, three or four and go, geez, why did that officer, firefighter, EMS, or why did that clinician or therapist make that decision? Well, 
I had two seconds to make that decision. I had three seconds to make that decision. Uh, I thought I did the best I could, you know, but obviously you've got the second guessing and not all the information that, you know, goes out every day. So those are, those are stresses that people don't think of. Yeah. And I like how you related it to therapy also, because for therapists, we may not see the same thing as you, but we hear pretty terrific, horrific stories. And sometimes it is like, right, is this sectionable? Is this reportable? Do I like you have to make that decision? And, you know, some therapists said, well, you can make it after the session. I'm like, well, no, I think that's unfair. You got to do it right in front of them. I'd rather get your, you know, you're, you're an a-hole right in front of my face than waiting and then being an a-hole behind their back, so to speak. So sometimes it, that's also like, again, nothing compared to police or first responders. I am not comparing myself to that. But that's the stuff that's really tough. And sometimes I think we underestimate how much therapists and police have a judgment call to make within, like you said, two or three seconds that can make or break sometimes people. And then I was going to bring that up today is that then we get second guessed. You know, why did you not do this? Or, you know, in our particular field in Massachusetts, and I can't speak for murder states, but for us now, domestic violence is a reportable uh, thing that we have to do through HIPAA. And is that domestic violence? Is that not? And if you do some, you know, I, I have my own pet peeves about certain agencies, and I'm going to keep to myself right now and try to be polite. But, you know, like you report it and you take a good family and you screw up their life, like you said, and they have like restraining or over something that maybe they're like, you misunderstood what I meant. And then the other ones you go, that's eh, not too bad. And then you have injuries to X, Y, Z or worse. And you're like, oh, and people don't recognize that for therapists. So I appreciate you recognizing that, uh, Jay. And it's kind of nice to see how soft you know, our friendship has made us, it made you overall. Um, but I'm, I'm going to not say that to everyone. <laughs> well, you brought it up about um, also just touching upon it. Like you think of, you know, 51A, we're big, we're big and bad. We're cops, all this stuff. But you, that box you check on, say if uh, 51A, family notified. Some people walk away and they're like, oh, I'm final 51A. Did you tell the family? And also, you know, DCF will ask that digital family and you get some people like, no, or like, no, tell them because maybe you're going to, especially in a small department, you could be the one going with the social workers. You could be the one going with DCF to this house and they may think, okay, well, it's clear, you know, we'll deal with DCF or, or social services at some point. And, um, and for those outside of Massachusetts department of children and families, um, and then you're showing up there and now I'm not the person taking your child away. That's not my decision, but I'm the one in uniform standing there telling a parent, which another heartbreaking thing is hand your child, hand your baby over to this stranger. And the stranger who is entrusted by the government is going to bring your child to a foster home for the night or a month or a week or, or, or whatnot, you know, and those are the things like those decisions in front of people tell them, Hey, listen, I'm filing a 51 a, well, what's a 51 a explain it to them. You know, this is what I see. I am a mandated reporter. Um, I don't make the decision, but I have to tell, you know, this agency for the welfare of these children, you know, and those are tough decisions too. You know, like I said, everyone talks, Oh, murders and drownings and this, these are tough decisions. Once again, you all have to make also because you're mandated reporters. And I think of chins also, and I don't know if that's still called the case, but sometimes even the chins, like the parent, we really need help. And then you explain what the chins are like, oh, that's not what I wanted. Sorry, the wheels are in motion. Um, I really yeah. can't stop the wheels suddenly. Um, and that causes a lot of friction. And I'm not going to name again the agency, but agencies who take good families and you're trying to get services and then they kind of like blow it up to bigger than it should be or cases and again i don't i'll turn to you caitlin i'm sure it happens to you too uh jay sometimes i'll look at a case like oh this is clearly like take the kid away this is this you know clear as day for me and dcf says yeah no findings it's not it's fine and that holding that information going what the hell is going on 
can be very, very difficult for, again, I'll talk as a therapist. I don't want to talk for you for first responders, but for me, it's really a difficult situation. I don't know if you guys relate to that or. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. I've had the same experience. Um, I think absolutely having some of those, that information and being like, really? Like, we're going to do nothing with this, but we're going to do something with this other thing that seems much less significant and severe. Okay. Um, it's hard. It's hard to deal with. And I've, I've worked with officers on cases um, where they felt the same way, like, or they found out that, you know, they get the letter from DCF saying like your 51A was screened out or whatever. And the officers would come up to my desk and be like, are you kidding right now? Like, is this real? I'd be like, I can <laughs> um, You know, and I think the 51A decision to tell families is hard too, because sometimes telling them make, can make the situation uh, at home worse. Um, so, you know, it's like that decision too. Like, do we tell them? Well, uh, if it's going to make it worse, maybe not. Um, there's so many layers to it. Um, and I think the other thing, uh, yeah, is, you know, one of the things you try to say is like, these are these having this doesn't have to be a punitive thing it can provide you with services um but then there's that like a piece where you're like okay well we're, that's the hope that's what we're, we're hoping will happen but then if it doesn't happen then it's like okay well <laughs> sorry that it didn't get you the services that we thought maybe it would and that's can be difficult too do you find the same thing for you, Jay, when you're dealing with, you know, child in need of services, which is what the CHINS stands for? I didn't explain that properly, so I apologize. Yeah, and you also, um, child requiring assistance is also uh, used now. Um, yeah, you. it's tough. It's it's tough till um, a parent will have a 15-year-old. Uh, like, what what can you do? And we have strict laws in Massachusetts now. Um, those with juvenile reform, and not to go on a whole legal side of it, and you know beliefs along that. But it's tough. Um, so some juvenile reform was done. I, I believe some of the laws that were uh, specific to juveniles were unfair, um, but across the board they were wiped out um, because of discretion that was or wasn't used on the part of some officers that's neither here nor there, but sometimes all we can do is tell someone is um, for example, a missing, missing child or, or a person that they're not a runaway or missing child. They just are not, they're being disobedient to the parents. They went for a walk around the block. Well, you need to arrest them. Well, we can't arrest your kid for walking away. Well, why can't you? They're not listening to me. They're not coming home. Well, we can't do that. Well, you, can you throw them in the cell for 20 minutes? No, we can't do that either. Um, and it, especially in Massachusetts is you really can't hold a child. You have to get them to a, a facility that's approved um, by the state. Um, but we can say, okay, well, we have, child, we have something child requiring assistance. Well, what's that mean? Well, it's a non-punitive, well, should be non-punitive um, way of getting resources for you to help you with your teenager um, and whatnot. And, but sometimes, you know, probation gets involved because probation, uh, juvenile probation does handle it. Um, and you don't know, is that probation, probation officer going to work with you? Are they going to provide services or is it going to be a very strict, you know, everyone's different in the job they do. So. I think it's also very hard to kind of like the other thing that I find particularly I'll, I'll talk a little bit of my little experience with co-response or the crisis team and the parents would ask you what's going to happen next. And I don't know about you two, but usually my answer is truly, I don't know. I wish I could tell you what's going to be next. And that can be heartbreaking. If you got some, a kid that definitely needs, you know, need, has needs that need to be met when a child is out of control, but the parents are clearly not doing their job. I'm trying to be as politically correct as I possibly can here. That's a stressor. That's really hard. A lot of, again, you talk about people not seeing a little bit of the work that we do. I know nurses do that too. And I'm not trying to play down doctors and nurses. Don't get me wrong, but the general population doesn't know how it is when people are like, Oh, you just took my kid away to, to uh, what's next. It's not like we're going to Disney world. Cause it's not a super bowl. It's like, what the hell are we going to do? 
And I don't know how you handle that stress. But for me, sometimes that was even the worse stress than talking to the government agency. Yeah. I, I think of situations where you go to a house for situation A and then all of a sudden situation B and C, uh, <laughs> you know, come along. Okay. I've got this done, but oh my God, there's mold in the refrigerator. It's empty. Um, there's nothing in the cupboards. There's animal feces, possibly human feces on, on, on the ground. And there's a toddler crawling around and they just picked up a, and I'm sorry if I'm freaking anyone else that's listening to this, but these are calls. These are things that happen when we, we as police, fire clinicians in the co-response world go to these houses and you got a, a baby putting up a, a pacifier or binky, whatever you, you know, your terminology is for it in their mouth. And you're sitting there in shock and you're watching and it's totally, I don't want to say normal, but it's, it's standard. And you're like, Oh, time out. Time out. The, the fridge is open. It's not raining. There's no food. There's mold. There's the feces on the ground. Okay. We got to do something here. Those are stressors because you think, Oh my God, I would never, and you don't fault the, the parent for it. Are there some cases you want to get really angry at the parent? Absolutely. But you sit there and like, maybe afterwards, after you take your effect, you sit there and go, Oh, I'm so glad that my children are in this situation or um, how, if you don't have children, I've seen officers say, how, how, how does this even happen? Well, there's multiple reasons for happening. And, and, um, but at that time, that's not the correct, it's the correct what's happening at the here and now, you know, maybe there's counseling and maybe there's help and maybe there's all sorts of services that can be provided. But at the moment you're like, I can't allow this toddler to crawl around where the dog went to the bathroom on the carpet. You know, it sounds horrible, but these are the little things we don't think about that you deal with every day. Yeah, I think um, to just to add to that, like, like you said, Jay, those are the things that like can be really stressful for first responders, like not only because like you're like just because of what it is, but because, you know, first responders are also humans. So you have lives outside of first responding, you have relationships, you have kids of your own, maybe nieces or nephews that you're close to, whatever, like you have a human life outside of being a first responder. And so those things can like get to you in a visceral way when you're seeing things like that and you're thinking about your your own kid at home or, you know, you see a domestic violence case and you're thinking about your own relationship. Um, You know, those things, like you said, are sort of some of the things that we don't talk about as much because the trauma of, you know, the bigger traumas are the things that we really talk about when we talk about first responder mental health. But the problem is, is that it's the trauma and the like being a human on top of it, right? Like you have, there's just being a a human adult comes with challenges, like, you know, like relationships and work and you know, what are we having for dinner every night for the rest of our lives? Like you have to make, you know, like adulting is a thing that can cause stress. And then you, as first responders, you have to do that. And then you have all these other big things like the trauma and the whatever. And then the littler calls that we don't talk about, but clearly are things that can have an impact. And I think, um, you know, that's why we need to keep talking about it and, and making it normal for first responders to get support around some of that stuff because it's, can, it all impacts, it's every, it all comes full circle, right? You know, right. well, it's, it's not the job that's, that's really the source of my stress. Okay, well, we talk more and more and more. Oh yeah, well, cause of work. Oh, right. Cause it's all, you, they're, they're not, they're not, uh, you know, exclusive from one another um and i think that's important yeah i think that you know i should say uh finding your way through therapy caitlin d j ball steve biso um we talked about this on the previous podcast uh i think we're we were all on but i'll repeat it sometimes it's not the first trauma it's the 27th one Mm -hmm. and i i use 27 my because i think it's sometimes like it's those little things like you wonder you get in your your vehicle after you know making that call that you just described jay those are all real calls and then you go wow i want to check on my niece and nephew maybe haven't seen them in a while and then oh crap I, and then it brings a lot of other stuff and family issues and what 
people forget you said human being i think that that's the thing is that we have a job but then we are humans outside of that and sometimes i think that when you know and i'm not blaming any police officers or any first responders we forget that you know it's one of those things that um you know i've once worked with someone who had a uh, her spouse was a, a firefighter and the spouse came in and she said to him can you stop talking about the blue baby you held and like that's how insensitive you can also get from your family because you know that screwed up someone somewhere me yeah. and i think that that's the stuff i feel is also hard because how can you explain that to a family member how can you explain that to mm-hmm. people and it's not a conversation like again it's like you said you know people, oh you have a story for me who really wants to hear about a fucking blue baby happened to me last weekend Jay, yeah. give, give me a story <laughs> and my wife knows that I'm not going to answer that question. Or if I do answer that question, I'm going to go, have I got one for you? Mm-hmm. And then I mortify everyone. And, I, and um, I, I will say, I don't know this for a fact, but I heard that I may have aggravated my uncle because I said something and he's like, oh, you want a story? And I was going on a little sleep at a little family gathering. I, I gave him a story. And I think it was my uncle kind of was wringing his hands at the time. Maybe I was wrong, but people not- noticed it. But that's the thing. Either we don't go to these parties or we don't go to these group events because we don't want to say anything or, okay, you want a story? You know, not everything's an episode of cops or, or, or live PD. You know, the thing I always talk about those shows, you know, live PD. Wait, I got to stop you. Oh, it's, it's, I think it, I thought it was like a law and order or criminal intent. Oh yeah. You get me started. That's, that's a four hour show we can do later. Get me, the get DNA me test went in five hours. That's what I, oh, you get me all unraveled. But, um, you know, it, you, think of when you watch these shows and people are like, oh, I watch cops or I watch live PD. Think of when you watch these shows. Have you ever seen a murder? Have you ever seen someone die? Have you ever seen, uh, yeah, you may see some disgusting apartments, which, which a person would say disgusting apartments. But think of what you may see there. Oh, and, and people are amazed. Oh, you know, I, I see the officer from Tulsa, uh, Sticks is his name. I can't think of his real name, but he's all over the place. Um, but you don't get to the everyday, the, the story or the call that I'll be like, hey, uh, Caitlin, um, can you go by the side desk? I'm going to send an officer around to grab you. I need you down here now. You know, and Caitlin's not coming to settle a, a standoff at barricade person, not going to come help us, you know, with a murder suspect. She's coming because we just saw something like, yeah, this is beyond that. We need a professional here right now. And those aren't the calls you see on on those TV shows, you know, and we've kind of described some of them, you know, with children and and with um I, I for lack of getting descriptive cleanliness, maybe or or just mental health calls. You know, you don't see those as much. Yeah, you see the ones where someone may be running out of traffic, but it's it's not as overt as that, you know, and, and that's why, you know, there's my pitch for co-response, but that's my pitch. Get me, give me a professional down here. We know, especially in our department, we know our limitations. And on top of knowing our limitations, we know that we can turn to um, professionals such as Caitlin and, and our, the agency we use, you know. Right. And I, and, and maybe that's a good way to jump back to something that, you know, we, we, we talked about off air, uh, but you're talking about some police and veterans reaching out more and talking about mental health. And I think that that's part of it too. I feel like, you know, I don't know, Caitlin, again, I didn't do it as long as you, so I will not, I never pretend things I don't do. What I found fascinating is half my job sometimes was to sit there and listen to a police officer talk about his story. Uh, and I've told you who I used to ride around, around with Jay and, you know, like, oh yeah, yes. Stories. And yeah, not stories about personal stories, not about the mm-hmm. police work, but personal stories. Um, I think that, you know, you said, you know, Jay, you're saying that people are reaching out a little more about the mental health. Do you think that we're finally making a dent in the system of, you know, the, the first responder system in regards to that? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, you know, we, Caitlin and I have, have put out stats before by Blue Help. And do we always talk about their low? I always say are these high or low. And you know, you always get, well, it's high because of this, but it's low because of underreporting. Right now, um, officer suicides are down. Do I think the number that they put out there is a true representation even today? No, I don't. Um, but do I think that 
more officers and first responders are looking for help? Yes. Um, maybe it's because, you know, obviously I'm a police officer, but I'm kind of, you know, involved in the field a little bit. I talk with Kate and a lot. I talk with you a lot, Steve. Um, maybe it's because of that. And people, I'd like to think people may trust me and come to me, but I haven't seen an increase um, in people looking uh, to talk to someone. Uh, maybe just for maintenance, but um, Memorial Day was a tough day for a lot of people, not just Memorial Day of the day, but before and after. It was a tough day for a, a lot of um, veterans um, who may be first responders also. Um, do I think things are working in 2022 up to it? Yeah, I do. Because um, if I just look back to when I became a cop in 2004, no, nah, I don't think, I, I, I truly don't think there was any reaching out um, and you said about stories that you heard in cruises. Well, let's think about it. Um, the model that we use at our department started in 2003. Um, there was a study done on it by Doherty Associates in 2004. Um, so we're looking at that area of time where I became a police officer, just kind of uh, ca catching on. But now we've had 18 you know, plus years since then. And I think... Uh, one, I think police are better educated, especially in this part of the country. And that's nothing against any other part of the country. I just think a lot of officers, the amount of officers that have social work degrees, um, that have psychology degrees, um, and not saying that's something you have, but if you look around, master's degrees, it used to be, oh yeah, come home from war, come home from here, go become a police officer, you got a high, high school diploma. And yes, when I became a police officer, I got out of the military at a high school diploma. But now you see younger uh, officers getting on now. And not that I never was a formal education person. I think you learn a lot more outside of a formal education. But I will admit that I've learned a lot of things formally also. And it's, that's probably a little convoluted. But, um, but it is true. I think we're doing a better... I think we're seeing things. I think we're learning things. I think we're sharing with each other a little bit more. I have no problem telling stories of mine in, in class. I have no problem telling guys who I work with different things about myself and hope that they open up because I really don't, you know, I don't care telling people stuff. Um, if you've got a problem with it, then you know, it's not my problem. It's, it's theirs. And I know that's kind of back to that sarcasm and off the cuff kind of thing that we do as police officers, but I have no problem saying that I've, I've had issues in the past zero. Um, because I know at the end of the day, I can ask people in different police departments that I know saying, oh yeah, Jay's still that you know, crazy cop. You know, he'll do any, you know, he'll do this, he'll do that. But at the end of the day, things have affected me over the years. So I think we are doing a, a better job. And I say we, as in, um, you know, you, you, you professionals like yourselves, police officers and anyone helping out the amount of friends. I know I have circle of friends now, police officers that are into uh, mental health and two different things. It's amazing how many police, I don't think people realize how many police officers actually have got into, I say, you know, they've got the social work degrees and I don't think people realize how many police officers actually have PhDs, have, have, um, uh, have degrees in psychology and social, social work and stuff. Caitlin. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I agree. I think even from when I started co-response in 2014, um, I think it's come a long way. Um, I agree, Steve, I 100% um, <laughs> spent many hours in cruisers thinking, wow, like, like, wow, <laughs> right? Because, <laughs> because they, because, you know, they're not talking to you know, they're not necessarily talking to professionals, but they know as a, they know that as a clinician who works for the department and, you know, sort of been vetted by the department, like the department did my background check, they, you know, sort of trust me at a certain point and they know that I'm a therapist. So they know that they can tell me stuff and that I'll listen. And they also know that I'm not going to go, you know, blab in my mouth to people about it. Right. So it's like they, it's almost like the subconscious thing where like they know that you're there. So they're just like, it just all comes out, um, you know, and, and you know, there were one of the things that like really, this is one of the things that really made me passionate about first responder work and, and seeing the gap that there is in first responder treatment across the, across the country, but across this 
area in particular um, was because of that, was because I would sit in cruisers with people and think, my gosh, like, what if this person was getting treatment? And, you know, what, what difference could that make? Like it could, and thinking about like, you know, um, job performance and safety and just all of those things um, is sort of really, you know, and then doing the mental health first aid with Jay and all that is sort of where I, why I ended up here um, and in this, in this new role. Um, so I definitely think we're, we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think of the one that most people refer to around here and no plug, just noting McLean Hospital has a wait list for their first responder. I, there's a name for it. I can't remember the name of it. Leader program. Thank you very much. But they have a wait list. And mm -hmm. I think that if you told me in 2014 that they're going to there's going to be a wait list at the leader program, I would have laughed. Mm -hmm. And today we're getting there. So I do see that. I see a lot of first responders come to therapy more often and you know that's the that's the stuff that i think we've done I, if i don't want to misquote someone i think we all know but you know police officers are social workers with guns anyway and i don't want yeah. to misquote anyone we know so i'm, I'm not yeah. going to say the name just in case it's the wrong quote yeah uh, but yeah. I think that they've been, I think a lot of like, like I've seen a lot of police officers embrace that. Cause I remember going into non-specific departments or non-specific probation or parole offices. And I would be said, Oh, you're the hug a thug guy. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I haven't heard that term. Like I've had a few new people, you know, in the last few years. And when I say that, they're like, what? Someone said that to you. So I've seen that also as a good way to kind of like evolve, but you all laugh because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, and I think I, I do think that co-response growing in, in the state and across the country is a huge contributing factor to that because I think it's bringing more awareness to mental health in general and that cops are not mental health professionals you know, firefighters are not mental health professionals, but they're the ones responding and responding to these calls and basically being asked to be the mental health professional, right? Like they're the, you know, police officers are able in Massachusetts to section somebody to the hospital involuntarily. That's a, you know, that's a big decision for a police officer to make when they're not mental health trained, right? So I think having the co-response has really right, brought this awareness about the amount of mental health calls that first responders are dealing with and that they they needs to be that thing, that assistance but then on the other side too i think stuff that's been happening just across uh the country in the last couple of years you know the school shootings the whatever the you know like and and thinking about like the trauma that that first responders see every day and how that impacts the mental health, their own mental health. I think the awareness of that is growing as well. And I think that makes a difference. Yeah, you brought up the, and it's always a discussion, you know, police officers can section in Massachusetts. Um, when I worked at a school, I would have social workers who had full power to do that. Look at me and go, you section that person? And I looked at them and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm probably going to get the parent. No, we need to section them. And people I am friends with, and if they listen to this, I'm still your friend. And we've had this discussion, <laughs> but you want me, the cop, to section this person. I have no problem. If you're harmed to yourself or others, I have no problem filling out the pink paper we can, and sending it to the hospital. I have no problem. As a juvenile, I'm going to look at it a little bit more. But you have full power as a social worker to section someone. You want me to do it because why? Well, I don't have that liability. I have the same liability and I'm the one that's really not trained in this. Okay. Are you going to hurt yourself? There was the, the, my favorite question. You know, I always go on this tangent in class. Oh no, I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm going to F and kill myself. You know, I say right. that all the time because yeah, maybe I hurt myself as, you know, non-suicidal self-injury and you know, people say, Oh, that, the, the kid cuts all over their arms. Well, okay. What are they doing for? Have you looked into why they're doing that? Well, obviously they're trying to hurt themselves. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a fine line between hurting yourselves and are they going to kill themselves? 
but we're thrust in a role of, um, and this is kind of where I'm getting to. Uh, I'm not, I am a, a, a 1 million percent proponent of, of co-response. Do I think officers should be trained in, um, in mental health as we are in Massachusetts? Sure. But we see some of these agencies come into some CIT trainings, crisis intervention trainings, especially in this area of the country where we're not, we're different with CIT than they are in the West and in, in the Midwest. And they say all these things. Okay, great. It's 5.02 on a Friday night. What do you do? Well, we'll get back to you on Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Well, well time out, time out, time out. It's Saturday at 8 p.m. What do you do? Well, we'll get back to you. We'll follow up with you. No, it's not following up. I need that. Like I said, I'll throw that out there. I love co-response. I need that clinician there, or I need further training. Well, my officers need further training to do the right thing because we are in a role of sectioning people. You know, it's easy to say, oh, we do this. We'll be there for you nine to five. Okay. Well, what happens outside those hours? What happens on the weekend? But if I have a clinician there or a clinician available to me in smaller towns, we're lucky. We're a larger jurisdiction where we have clinicians whenever we want them. Smaller towns share one clinician, but they at least have them by phone. Okay. You can't tell me that at six o'clock on a Friday night, we'll call you Monday morning. That doesn't work. I need a clinician on that phone. Even if they're four miles away out of the department where we're sharing a clinician, at least I know I can rely on them and they have their people, their doctors who they can rely on. Um, Cause I don't want to send someone to the hospital involuntarily. Have I done it a lot in my career? Absolutely. For reason and cause. But if I can rely on the professionals, meaning yourself and Caitlin and your colleagues, I'd rather do that, you know, and, and some of the clinicians obviously uh, have to call the doctor to get that. So let's get this. I think police should have the power to section people. All right. And I won't go off on a tangent. I promise, Steve. I believe that they should because we're there 24 mm-hmm. seven. But think of this. Someone like yourselves who are trained, have master's degrees in this, have to call a doctor to send someone to the hospital. It's, 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 it's mind boggling sometimes. Um, I'm glad we have the power. I think it saves lives. I think that we do, but w- w- we'll get the calls from the hospital. Oh, you, oh, oh, you section this? And you had a doctor at the ER screaming at you. And it's like, what would you like me to do? Well, this person's not presenting any, any suicidal tendencies or homicidal tendencies. Okay. But you know what? 20 minutes ago, this is what they said. So you're either believing them, which is fine, believe them, because I know you've got a busy ER and you, you, they medically cleared, so now you're giving them this, but you're yelling at me when I've had a split second decision and I've got no one there to help me to make this decision. Right. And you, you know, you're going to board them and that's a problem. And, you know, um, again, we're, we've been talking for an hour again, it goes way too fast. But one of the things that I would, I would say to you, uh, and I find this particularly interesting, Jay, is that I remember in 2004, sitting there educating do- like police officers on how to use a section 12, how, you know, the pros and cons and stuff like that. Now we're having a bunch of mental health clinicians and social workers who are not able to use a section 12 and turning to police. How screwed up that we have to educate now the social workers and the mental health and the police actually get it. And not again, nothing against the police. Obviously you've known me long enough for that, but it's just, it's when you said that, I'm like, it's a total role reversal. Yeah. It blows my mind. Sometimes it's like, sometimes you wait for that ER doctor to call. And because, you know, it's kind of hinky, but you know what, at the end of the day, and this is why I want people to understand. Yeah. It stinks. Sometimes we have sex with someone, but when we section someone, we're, we're and most of the time it's because they, they're dangerous to themselves. We look at it as we're saving their life. None of this big, Oh, I saved the life thing because no one's going to give you an award for this. But at the end of the day, the reason I sent you to the hospital is because something made me think, and I have no other backup at that time from a professional like yourselves at that time saying, this person, if I leave them alone, I'm going to come back and it, you know, I don't want to get into it, but I'm going to come back and it's not going to be the, you know, it's going to be a different situation. On that happy note, I think we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, no, I, you know, the one thing I want to say is that th- these are hard conversations, but like I said, if you told me when I started in 04 at the Framingham police department, 
that I would I would now be educating my colleagues on how to use a Section 12 and not rely on the police. I would have said, you're out of your skull. That ain't going to happen. And this is where we're at. So it tells you how far police and first responders have come. And maybe we're, you know, mental health and social workers have not taken full responsibility for some of the stuff they have to do. And yes, I said that about my colleagues, and I would say it to the faces of many people. I have no qualms about that. Um, but next time, I think that what we got to do, and obviously you're invited again, I want to talk more about the veterans court, but I also want to talk about veterans and some of the stuff that's going on between, you know, Veterans Day, between uh, what's going on in Ukraine, and also kind of like the stigma of like trauma, because, you know, you're not missing an arm, you're just traumatized, and that's mm -hmm. less worthy of disability. I think it would be a good conversation. And with tying that to the, uh, the treatment court in Framingham, I think that would be a great, great type of uh, thing that would be very interesting because it is first responders, but a lot of military personnel and former military have kind of like, you know, have another stigma that I feel is very difficult to handle. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. I agree. So uh, thank you again, guys. And, and, and uh, hopefully uh, you don't have to section anyone anytime soon. Um, oh. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. <laughs>